Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the IWH Speaker Series for March the 8th, 2022. My name is Peter Smith, and it's my pleasure today to introduce Nancy Carnide, who's an Associate Scientist at the Institute for Work and Health. Nancy will be presenting today on cannabis use uh, findings, <laughs> cannabis use and the risk of workplace injury, which are findings from a longitudinal study of Canadian workers. Just a reminder for the presentation today, if you do have questions, you can pop them into the chat box and then at the end of the presentation, um, I will ask them directly to Nancy and she will answer them uh, as part of the presentation. For those of you who are joining us for the first time and you wanna hear more about news and events from the Institute for Work and Health, we have a webpage a link at the bottom of Nancy's first slide, iwh.om.ca backslash subscribe and you can find out all about how to join our various email lists and get information from the Institute for Work and Health. So with that, I will hand it over to you, Nancy, for today's presentation, and I will see you at the end um, of the presentation to ask you the questions. Bye. Great, thank you, Peter. So I'm very happy to be here today um, to be able to present to you some of the findings from our study on um, cannabis use among workers and the relationship with workplace injury. Uh, before I begin, I just want to um, first acknowledge the land on which the Institute for Work and Health operates. So for thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this land is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to conduct our work on it. So I'd also like to acknowledge um, our research team and um, my co-PI, uh, Peter Smith, um, as well as the Canadian Institutes of Health Research who funded uh, this, this study. And finally, I'd also, before I continue, like to acknowledge our stakeholder advisory committee who have provided us with guidance throughout this study, um, particularly on our data collection instruments. So before I get into the presentation, I'm gonna go right to the punchline. Um, for those of you who may not be able to stay for the whole, for the whole presentation, um, and I just want, these are the key messages that I want you to take away from today's presentation. So we asked workers about their cannabis use and about their experiences of workplace injury. And when we asked them about cannabis use in general, what we found was that cannabis use in the past year was found to be marginally associated with a greater risk of workplace injury. But the key here is that that's not the whole story. We need to think about cannabis use in proximity to work. What we, when we did ask about use before or at work, what we did find is that use before and or at work in the past year was significantly associated with a greater risk of workplace injury. However, uh, among workers who reported use in the past year, but not before or at work, they were not found to be at an increased risk of workplace injury. So before I get into how um, the, the specifics of our study and how we got to those results, just a little bit of background. So my research program is really focused on um, substance use in, in the working population. And I will say that really um, the implications of substance use in working populations isn't, hasn't been historically a focus of occupational health research. But there have been a number of um, events in the last several years that have really um, brought substance use to the forefront um, in, in occupational settings. The opioid overdose crisis is one of them, but specifically around cannabis use, uh, there, there's been a couple of things that I think have really started to make individuals in the occupational health and safety community start to think about um, how workers are using cannabis and what those effects can be. Uh, so for instance, legalization and decriminalization is happening really globally. Um, whether it be medical cannabis, non-medical cannabis, uh, or both. Here in Canada, as I'm sure many of you are aware, we, um, we've had a medical uh, cannabis program for over 20 years, but in October 2018, 2018 uh, we legalized non-medical cannabis. Uh, in the United States, while at a federal level, uh, med non-medical cannabis is still considered illegal, many states have introduced um, their own versions of, of different laws around medical and non-medical cannabis. 
So this is becoming, I think, this is really starting to lead towards cannabis becoming more normalized and certainly more accessible uh, to the general public. And I think also over the last several years, there's been um, certainly increasing public interest in the use of cannabis for uh, different therapeutic purposes. Um, so things like for pain, for sleep, for stress even. And um, with, again, with cannabis becoming more normalized, uh, we, we need to start to think about how you know, workers may be, um, and be, may be using cannabis um, for a variety of different reasons. And workers are using cannabis. Uh, so in our uh, workplace cannabis study, um, when we looked at, um, when we asked workers about their use of cannabis in, just before legalization, um, what we found is that 29% of workers reported using cannabis in the past year. And of those workers, 25% reported using before and or at work, which is equivalent to about 7% of our in entire sample. When we, um, when we look at on the right-hand side, you'll see some results from some of the more population-based studies um, here in Canada. So Statistics Canada put out um, a, a quarterly survey called the National Cannabis Survey just before legalization and just after. And um, they reported that in the first quarter of 2019, they found that 13% of all respondents using cannabis in the past three months also reported using it before or at work. And likewise, Health Canada's Canadian Cannabis Survey, uh, the most recent version in 2020, found that among employed respondents using cannabis in the past year, 29% also reported using before or at work. So as I mentioned, um, cannabis or substance use in general is, hasn't really been a focus of research in the occupational space. However, I was really pleased to see this commentary come out in 2020, um, led by um, individuals from NIOSH in the US, calling for more research on cannabis and work specifically. And so they identified um, a number of different areas where they felt more research was needed. Um, so there were six areas, but in particular, one of the things that they really were, were focusing on was on that relationship between cannabis use and occupational injury. And why do we need to worry about that? Well, cannabis um, can have acute effects that are relevant to workplace safety. So um, different um, psychomotor and cognitive impairments. So things like um, distortion of time, altered space perception, uh, slowered reaction time, decreased concentration and attention span, dizziness, fatigue, all of these things in the context of a workplace uh, could pose a safety risk if someone has used cannabis. So what has the literature to date told us about cannabis and work injury? So there's been about 13 studies with um, a comparison group that have looked at this relationship. Of that 13, seven studies found that found some evidence that cannabis um, is associated with an increased risk of workplace injury. On the other hand, six studies found no association between cannabis and workplace injury. So really what we're left with is this sort of mixed bag of studies with mixed findings, contradictory findings, um, and we don't know what is the, what is the true relationship. So I think it's important to keep in mind um, the key limitations of some of these previous studies and perhaps why um, we haven't seen any sort of consistent findings. So two thirds of the studies were cross-sectional, which means that we're measuring exposure and outcome at the same time point, which is a problem in terms of temporality. We don't know what came first. And with cannabis, um, so again, cannabis potentially could lead to injury, but you can also imagine, especially with the potential therapeutic benefits of cannabis, you, someone who may experience an injury may also be using it um, after their injury to um, deal with the, the, the symptoms of their injury. So having these cross-sectional studies make up the bulk of the, the literature is problematic. In terms of the exposures that um, these studies looked at, they, they typically were these sort of broad measures, mostly self-reported um, around either use of cannabis in the past year or in their lifetime. 
and they didn't really consider certain ex important exposure metrics. So things like the potency, oh sorry, the potency of the cannabis that um, they were using, the the timing of the use, um, or whether there was actual impairment, and then uh, residual confounding. So a, a number of these studies really didn't control for really important sources of potential confounding. So things like use of other substances, um, health, um, health uh, uh, like general health, fatigue, and the nature of the job. So we, um, given all of those limitations, we were trying to address at least some of them in our study. So the objectives of our analysis were to examine the relationship between cannabis use and the risk of workplace injury, particularly workplace use. And we're using that we're doing this in a longitudinal sample of Canadian workers. So a little bit about the sample recruitment. We we've been conducting surveys of workers from across Canada yearly from 2018, which was just before legalization to 2021. Workers were eligible to enter our study if they were employed for at least 15 hours per week in workplaces with five or more employees. And we were uh, interested in um, collecting information from workers from a variety of occupations and industries, as well as workers, not only those who used cannabis, but also those who did not use cannabis. The recruitment of our sample was conducted by a private research firm, Ecos Research Associates. And most of our sample was obtained um, from this pre-existing panel of about 100,000 households um, where individuals have agreed to participate in surveys from time to time. Uh, a small proportion of our sample was also obtained using traditional random digit dialing. So again, we've been conducting yearly set studies, uh, surveys from 2018 to 2021. And here you can see where some of the key things were happening in that timeline. So non-medical cannabis was legalized in October of 2018. Uh, edibles and concentrates were introduced to the market in about late 2019, early 2020. And then of course the COVID pandemic began in early 2020. We began with 2014 workers in 2018, and at each survey point, we, we continued to ask people if they would could, um, participate. Um, but we would supplement our sample at each time point um, so that from, the, from time two to time four, um, we were always trying to get at least 4,000 workers. So we, um, for the purposes of this analysis, we focused on the first three um, time points. So from 2018 to 2020. So for our analysis, we looked at two main exposures that were derived from survey questions on lifetime cannabis use, frequency of pasture cannabis use, and the frequency of use before and at work. So our first exposure was sort of what we call general cannabis use. So we categorized, categorized workers um, into three categories. Uh, never use, so they've never used, they reported never using cannabis in their lifetime. So former use, where they used cannabis, but it was more than 12 months ago. And pasture use, where they used cannabis, they reported using cannabis in the last 12 months. The second exposure is workplace cannabis use. And again, we categorized uh, workers into three categories. So the first category is no pasture use. And if you look on the left-hand side, you'll see that no pasture use is actually a co is combining that never use group and the former use group. So these are individuals who do not, who did not use cannabis in the past year. And then we, the last two categories are individuals who reported using cannabis in the past year, but they either um, did not use cannabis before or at work, which is our non-workplace pasture use category, or they did report using cannabis uh, either two hours before work, while working, and or on breaks. And that's our workplace pasture use category. Our outcome uh, was based on responses to the following questions. So during the past 12 months, have you experienced an incident that resulted in injury to yourself while working? And so workers, we categorize workers as experiencing an injury uh, while working in the past year if they endorsed yes on this question. 
we looked at a number of covariates, and again, because we're trying to address some of those residual confounding issues um, across uh, sociodemographics, so we collected information on age, sex, region, and their highest education level achieved. We collected information, sort of health-related information, so general, self-reported general health, their frequency of alcohol consumption, and uh, smoking. And we also collected information on their work and workplace. So in terms of work, we asked information about the number of hours they worked per week, their typical work schedule, whether it was a regular or irregular shift, um, how, if, whether they had a permanent job and how long they'd been in that job, whether they uh, worked in, um, performed hazardous work at least weekly, whether they had a supervisory role, whether they had contact with the supervisor on a regular basis during the workday, and whether they performed their job duties um, in front of others, um, including coworkers or the public on a regular basis. And then in terms of workplace characteristics, we looked at, we asked about workplace size, the industry that they worked in, whether they had a, a formal substance use policy, and whether they had smoking restrictions in their workplace. So if you look at the graph at the bottom, um, just to give you a sense, again, we were looking at information that we were collected from the first three time points of our survey. So we were always looking to um, only include individuals who participated at adjacent um, surveys. So for those who participated at both time one and time two, we captured their cannabis um, exposures and covariates at time one, and then looked at their work injury at time two. For those participating at time two and time three, likewise, we also captured their cannabis exposures and covariates at time two and their work injury at time three. And we modeled this using a modified Poisson regression with robust error variance to estimate the relative risks and the 95% confidence, confidence intervals between each of our two exposures and our outcome of workplace injury. And we adjusted for all of, our, all of our covariates in a series of nested models, plus uh, survey mode, so whether they participated online or by telephone, and an indicator for whether they were in the time one, time two group, or in the time two, time three group. So this is a fairly uh, busy slide, but really what I just want to bring you, your attention to is how many observations we ended up with. So um, if you, if you, hopefully you can see this arrow. Um, when we essentially, we had um, 1,030 individuals who participated at both time one and time two and remained eligible at both time points. And then we also had 1,715 workers who participated at both time two and time three and remained eligible at both time points for a total of 2,745 observations. Now, of that 2,745, we had 445 individuals who participated only between time one and time two. We had 1,130 workers who participated at time two and time three only. And then we also have this group of individuals, 585, who participated at all three time points. And we, we've included their information from time one, time two, and then from time two and time three, and our modeling accounts for that sort of clustering of repeated observations. So on to the results. So in terms of the sample, we um, so the workers in our sample had a mean age of 46.2, um, just over half were male, and it was a fairly highly educated group. So 89% had some, at least some post-secondary education. Just over half reported that they had um, very good or excellent general health. 47% uh, reported um, at least some sort of weekly alcohol consumption, and most were non-smokers. In terms of their work characteristics, so um, this was generally a full-time um, uh, working sample. So the mean weekly hours were 38.8. Most worked um, a typical regular shift and um, had a permanent job. 44% of our sample had a supervisory role and two thirds of our sample um, indicated that they performed their job duties very often in front of others. 
Uh, three quarters of our sample reported um, that their workplace has a formal substance use policy. And when looking at workplace size, just over half um, reported that they had a workplace size of over 100. When we look at the composition in terms of the types of jobs, so 37% of um, the sample reported conducting hazardous work tasks at least on a weekly basis in the past 12 months. And then you can see on, on the yellow, um, the variety of different industries represented by the, um, the workers in our sample. So this just gives you a sense of what our exposure, our first exposure looks like in the sample. So on the left-hand side, you'll see the categories of general cannabis use status. Um, so we had 29.5% of our sample who reported that they had never used cannabis um, at their exposure time point. 37% um, reported uh, former use, so use more than 12 months ago. And 33% uh, reported using cannabis in the past year. And among that sample of uh, workers reporting past year use, um, you can see on the right-hand side the frequency of their cannabis use. So most um, were fairly infrequent, so 41% less than one day a month. Um, but if you look on the very right-hand side, you'll see that uh, 20 percent of uh, individuals reporting past year use were using cannabis on um, a daily or near daily basis. So when, when we look at our workplace cannabis use sample, um, we have so, so we have 67 percent who say that they did not use cannabis in the past year and again that's combining the never and former use groups. Then we look in the middle where we have 27 percent who reported using cannabis in the past year, but not um, it before and or at work. And um, on the right-hand side, you'll see that 5.9% of our sample reported using cannabis either before work or at work. And above that number, you'll see of that group, the vast majority of people um, said that they were using cannabis um, two hours before work. These categories aren't mutually exclusive, so some people um, may have said that they used it in all three um, situations or only two situations or only one. Um, but in most cases, even when they did use it in other situations, it was almost always um, also two hours before work. And then just to give you a sense of um, going back to that frequency of cannabis use by workplace use status, um, so the blue represents the individuals who reported using cannabis before or at work in the past year. The yellow are those who reported using cannabis in the past year, but not before or at work. And I think what I wanted you to take away from this is that generally speaking, those who reported using cannabis before or at work were also much more likely to report using it more frequently. So we have 42% of individuals who reported workplace use we're using cannabis on a, a daily or near daily basis. Contrast that to those not using cannabis before or at work, um, where we see 46.5% saying that they typically were only using it less than one day per month. So on to the main results here. So this is looking at um, the relative risks for work injury by our first exposure, um, which is general cannabis use. So here on the left-hand side, you'll see the unadjusted estimates, and on the right-hand side, you'll see the adjusted estimates. And here we're comparing um, former use, so our reference category is never use. So we're looking at the relationship between former, we're comparing former use to never use, and past year use to never use. If we just focus on the adjusted side, what you can see is that there's really no difference between people who used more than 12 months ago and those who never used. So the relative risk here was 1.08, the confidence intervals cross one, and there's really just no relationship between that. Um, but when we look at past year use, we see this sort of slight, about 27% increase in risk among those who use cannabis in the past year compared to never use um, in terms of the risk of workplace injury. But this is not technically statistically significant, um, it, I think the lower confidence limit was 0.94, but 
but it suggests that maybe there might be something happening there. But now when we look very specifically at workplace cannabis use. So here um, we're comparing our reference category is no pasture use. And we're looking at the risks of injury uh, among those reporting pasture use, but not at the workplace, and um, those who report some degree of workplace use. What we can see, again, if we just look at the adjusted side, what we see is that the relative risk comparing non-workplace pasture use to no pasture use is 1.06. There is no relationship between, there's no great, there's no increased risk um, between uh, when, we when we look at that group for workplace injury. But very clearly, when we look at the workplace pasture use uh, group, what we see is a doubling of risk. So the relative risk here is 2.01. So the risk of experiencing a workplace injury if you use workplace if you use cannabis um, before or at work is twice the risk of um, individuals who do not use cannabis in the past year. So I kind of want to bring back the limitations of those previous studies to sort of address what we were able to do and not do with this, with this study. So I think one of the things that we can say we checked off was that, um, you know, in terms of observational studies, a prospective cohort is um, the ideal. So here we're ensuring that our exposure occurred before our outcome. We also, um, sort of, I feel like we've advanced to this area because we've been able to account for the timing of use. We very clearly showed that workplace use is the, mo is the most important here um, in terms of the risk of, of cannabis um, or the risk of workplace injury associated with cannabis use. What we couldn't do, um, and, and I'd like to just acknowledge that up front, is that we weren't able to account for things like the type of cannabis, so the THC content, um, of the cannabis that was being used or the method of consumption, because um, there are differences between whether you inhale um, cannabis or whether you ingest it. And, and to that point, I think our workplace cannabis use um, variable, where we're asking about use before or at work, um, when we ask about use only two hours before work, that may not adequately address um, the use of edibles, because we know that when you ingest um, cannabis, the effects take longer to be felt, the peak effects take longer, and then they also last a lot longer than if you um, were to inhale it. So um, keep it, keeping that in mind, two hours may not have been um, quite sufficient. And of course, we didn't directly capture impairment. So we, we captured use, but that does not necessarily mean that these individuals were impaired at the workplace. In terms of confounding, I, you know, I think we, again, did um, quite a good job in terms of being able to control for a variety of potential confounders across different um, contexts, so socio-demographic, health, work, and workplace. Um, but one of the important things that we did not collect information on were um, issues around fatigue or uh, sleep. And, and that, I think, would, would be very important um, to, uh, to address in this relationship. Um, and while we did control for alcohol use, we did not have information on um, the use of alcohol before or at work. Uh, and we also didn't have any information, we didn't collect any information on prescription medications. And we know that some prescription medications can have an impairing effect. Um, so that is something that you know, perhaps could be addressed in, in future studies. Um, and I just, also just want to acknowledge that our workplace injury outcome, you know, it was a fairly uh, broad measure of injury, um, which, which really didn't assess, you know, the type of injury that the worker experienced, the severity of the injury. Um, and I think the other thing that is really important to think about when we think about cannabis in the workplace is that um, it's not just about the incidents that are experienced by the individual consuming the cannabis, but they can pose a safety risk for others in the environment in the environment as well and so we weren't able to capture incidents that may have occurred um you know while while the worker was working with others that may have occurred to other people in the workplace 
Having said all of that, I think, you know, I want to bring us back to our key messages. So we do see this slight non-significant uh, marginal increase in the risk of workplace injury associated with cannabis use in the past year. But it really, I think, is important to consider where that use is taking place. Because what we found is that it was really only use before and or at work in the past year that was associated with the risk of workplace injury. We did not see the same relationship for workers who did use cannabis in the past year, but outside of work. So what are the implications of this? So I think we do need some perspective. It really is important to keep in mind that the vast majority of workers who use uh, cannabis do not use it um, before or at work. And in fact, you know, another um, analysis that we've done has shown that there's been no, um, at least in the early period after legalization, there has been no change from pre to post legalization in terms of um, the prevalence of workers using before or at work. So I, taking away from our key messages, I think it's really important to make that distinction between people who are using cannabis at work um, or before work and those who maybe using it on a Friday night, um, you know, out days away from their, their next work shift. Um, those are, it's really an important distinction to make, I think, in terms of considering the workplace safety um, impacts of cannabis use, because clearly it's the workers that are using before at work um, are at an increased risk of, of workplace injury. And so what do we do about that? Um, I always say in all of my presentations that we need education. We need to educate employees on the basics of cannabis. Um, so, you know, what, what is THC? What is CBD? What, um, what are the effects of those? What happens if you inhale cannabis um, versus ingest it? Um, how long do those effects last? Um, and what are those, what effects can you experience when you, when you um, uh, consume cannabis? So, I really want to stress that we need to educate employees about this, um, especially in light of legalization. We, we can't ignore the fact, much like alcohol, cannabis is now, at least here in Canada, it's legal, it's you know, extremely accessible to anybody. Um, you know, we can't hide, um, you know, put our head in the sand about employees using cannabis. They're going to, if they're, they're going to use it, let's make sure that they use it in a safe manner um, that doesn't pose a risk to the workplace. And the other thing, um, just to keep in mind, I think for employers is really to be aware of, um, to be aware of and address any sort of the culture around substance use in the workplace. You know, that might be um, encouraging abuse or at least tolerating it, um, you know, not turning a blind eye. Um, if there's, if, you know, in some workplaces, um, someone might turn a blind eye to to workers that might be using cannabis and I think that you know we need to really think about that as well especially in the context of use at the workplace so with that said um, I don't know how many people are aware of this resource but um, individuals at the Canadian Center of on substance use and addiction have pu put together this really great um, toolkit of resources that are aimed at supporting employers and employees um, to address and prevent issues of substance use in the workplace. Um, this was designed initially, I think, for um, the trades. Um, however, you know, if you look through these, um, through the resources, I think there's a, you know, really broad applicability to a variety of sectors. Um, and you'll see on the right-hand side, they address issues, you know, around specific um, drug classes, including cannabis, but they also address issues around stigma, uh, risk factors, policies and procedures, um, and just education in general. And so I think, you know, if you haven't checked it out, I think this is a really great toolkit that um, can help uh, address substance use in the workplace. And with that, I shall end my presentation and take questions. Great. Thank you very much, Nancy, for the presentation. Just a reminder to people, if you do have a question for Nancy that you'd like to ask, if you could pop it in the chat box, um, there's a number of questions I've already got in front of me, but if you do have questions, please pop it in the chat box. We have a bit of time and I'm hopeful that we'll be able to get through all the questions that were asked. 
Um, Nancy, I've got a couple of specific ones which I might start with just around the study design before I hop into some of the more, the more general questions that are here. Um, one is just around reimbursement in the ECOS panel and for people who participated in this survey. Um, could you just describe if there is, was reimbursement available to participate in the survey and, and, um, and what type of reimbursement was available? Yeah, so um, to participate in the survey in general, um, individuals were uh, entered into a draw to uh, receive, um, gosh, <laughs> I'm trying to remember the amount. Um, it might have been um, $100 and it was, um, so they were entered into a draw to receive, and I think we had about eight of those, um, which really wasn't a lot out of the 40, over 4,000 people that participated at each time point. Um, in terms of the cannabis, we had a separate module where we asked very specific questions around, uh, around cannabis use patterns among those individuals who reported using cannabis in the past year. And individuals who reported using in the past year were offered $10 to complete um, that, uh, those additional set of questions. Okay. Um, a question just around the relative risks. So we have one question just around, if you could just help in terms of the interpretation of the relative risks. Um, what are they? They're not, are they percentages? Uh, if you could just describe um, just the basics of what a relative risk is. Maybe if you want to go back to that slide, I guess. Uh, yeah, let me just try and come back. So we can look at this one maybe. Um, yeah, so here, so everyone has an underlying risk. So in each of these, we, there's, an, there's an underlying risk for um, injury, depending on what category you are. Here, what we're saying is that the risk in, so for instance, in people who are using cannabis in the workplace, their risk is twice as high as the underlying risk of uh, for work injury among those people who did not use cannabis in the past year. So the relative risk is always in relation to another group of individuals. In this case, our reference is people who didn't use cannabis in the past year. When we look at general cannabis use, our reference was always never used. So we were always comparing what the risk was in people either using formerly or in the past year compared to those people who used it, um, who never used it before. I'm not sure if that answers the person's question adequately. Yes, I think it's just important to keep into account it's always relative to another group. Yeah. Um, in terms of, um, I guess, so just a, a couple more specific questions. There is, did you have information on the type of cannabis, the type of product that people were using and if particular types of cannabis use, either in terms of content or in mode of administration, were at increased risk of, of injury among those people who used it uh, before or during work? Yeah, so we do have some information. I have, um, I, I sort of anticipated certain questions. Um, so let me just really scan fast to some of these questions. Okay, oh gosh, sorry. Here we go. Let me try that again. We went a little too fast. Okay, so um, take that off. Um, one of the things is that we couldn't formally assess. We did ask questions around THC and CBD. Um, part of the problem is that we asked it in two different ways <laughs> at each of the time points. Um, and we really just didn't, so that was one of the issues. So we couldn't really assess the, the, um, the levels appropriately. And again, these were broad measures. We asked people what the typical THC and CBD content was. So what you'll see on the left-hand side, um, so at time one, we had asked people what sort of the general typical ratio was of their THC and CBD. So you'll see a group of people, 31.9%, who said that they used a high THC and a low CBD, um, followed by, you know, 17.9 saying high THC, high CBD, et cetera. Um, and then 37% who just didn't know. And then on the other side, you'll see at time two, we actually asked the THC and CBD um, separately, here I'm just showing you the THC. Um, and 
generally speaking, overall in our sample, I think across both, you can kind of sort of get the idea that they're using a generally a higher THC content, um, but we just weren't able, you know, uh, what in terms of THC, CBD, we couldn't do this because we asked this differently. And we also, just in terms of sample size, it's just hard to kind of, um, to account for that formally in our analyses. But it does give you a sense of, of what we're seeing in our sample. Um, likewise, with method of consumption, we did also ask about what they were doing. Um, here, you'll just see, uh, looking at it by, um, so the green is among all past year, uh, use, uh, uh, all, among all respondents reporting past year use, and then um, according to whether they used it in the workplace or not. And it wasn't specific saying when, you know, what type, what method of consumption you did um, when using in the workplace. It was just in general, what was the main, what is your main method of consumption? Um, so most people in our sample are either smoking or vaping. Um, there are, there's a small group that are um, doing sort of edibles, oils, tinctures, et cetera. Um, but again, in terms of being able to formally assess this in the, in the model, we've just weren't, it was, it, we, we wouldn't have had the sufficient sample size to be able to do that. And thank you, Nancy. And just in terms of the, the outcome, the injury outcome, um, could you just uh, restate how that was assessed and if you had the ability to look at whether cannabis was associated with particular types of injuries in the workplace? Yeah, so we, it was um, a very broad measure. So we li we just asked, so this, this study, just to keep in mind, was not designed to look at injury. The study was really designed to understand cannabis use patterns, perceptions, et cetera, before and after legalization to understand the impact of legalization. But we added this question about injury and we wanted to take advantage of the fact that we had this. So the question simply, um, again, if I just scroll back up so that I can, oh gosh, sorry. <laughs> I'm not doing very well with this. Give me a second. If I scroll back up to our outcome. So we asked, um, we asked individuals whether in the past 12 months they had experienced an incident that resulted in injury um, to themselves while working. And so they had the option of saying yes, no, or they, they could refuse to answer the question. Um, but anyone essentially that said yes to this question was considered to have had an injury, a workplace injury in the past year. So we didn't have information on you know, the type of injury that they experienced, um, you know, whether it was a cut finger versus a concussion, you know, we, we couldn't assess that, we couldn't assess severity um, at all with this particular study. So that's certainly a limitation, I think, of our, um, of our analysis. Um, so I think in future research, that would be something that could be addressed. Okay. Um, well, you've got the site, so there's been a couple of questions, a couple of questions which have come in, which I'm going to summarise about wanting to understand if the effects of cannabis use, so if cannabis use at work occurred in particular industries or occupations, or if the effects of cannabis use on work injury differed by people working in risky occupations versus less risky occupations. Is it possible for you to comment on, on that, Nancy? Yeah, and so that was also a question that um, that we anticipated getting. So I do have a few slides around that. Um, I didn't want to make it a prominent feature of the presentation, um, simply because we start to get into sample size um, issues. But let me just bring up some of these slides. Okay, so just one of the things we have a we have this variable called hazardous work. And what we were doing is that we were asking respondents the following question. Um, so thinking about your main job in the past 12 months, did you perform hazardous or safety sensitive tasks at least once a week? And we defined what we thought was hazardous or safety sensitive work that it could lead to, you know, that if it wasn't performed properly or safely, it could lead to harm. 
um, or damage. And we gave a variety of different examples of what that could include. So the typical things that you would think about driving a motor vehicle, operating machinery, working at heights, um, but also things like um, working where hazardous substances are present, um, sharps work, um, et cetera, planes. So you can see how we defined or how we identified people who are working in sort of hazardous work versus not. And then you can also see here where the industries um, sort of fall within, in, within these categories. So typically speaking, the people who indicated that they did do hazardous work tasks at least weekly um, came from healthcare and social assistance, manufacturing, trade, transport, and warehousing, um, as well as primary industry, including construction, and then some also in this other group. So that's really, so one of the things that we can't do with this study, again, because of sample size, is not look specifically within industries, but we, were, we did do some analyses around um, where we'd stratified by hazardous, um, hazardous work. So this is going to take just a little bit of an explanation. So here you'll see um, very much like before, but here you'll see the relative risks for uh, experiencing work injury by general cannabis. So this is the general cannabis use, and we've stratified it by hazardous and um, non-hazardous work. So let's just focus on the, the right-hand side where we're looking at our adjusted estimates. The first two are um, looking at the relationship between former use and past year use compared to never use among those who reported um, being in a hazardous work environment or doing hazardous work tasks. And the second um, on the right hand side here shows the, um, the estimates for those in non-hazardous uh, work. Um, so you'll see that in all cases there is the relationship is not significant. There is a marginal, again, increased risk among hazardous work for um, uh, associated with past year use. And then we actually see slightly higher for um, the non-hazardous work uh, group, which may seem counterintuitive, but just bear with me here. When we do this looking at workplace cannabis use, again, let's look at the sort of the right hand side. So this is the hazardous work group. Here we see the rel that the relative risk um, associated with using cannabis in the workplace is uh, 1.61 among those using um, among those in a hazardous work environment. When we look at the non-hazardous work, we also we actually see um, a much higher relative risk. Um, in, that, in that particular group who use cannabis at work. So the relative risk here was 2.86. Again, that might seem really counterintuitive because you might imagine that the relative risk might be higher among those in a hazardous work environment. But it is important to keep in mind, it's all, this is a relative measure. What, what is kind of obscured by these um, results are the actual underlying risks. So we also looked at the absolute risks um, which um, feed into these relative risks, but we, we look at the absolute risk, which is really sort of the likelihood that the outcome will occur in a particular group. This is by general cannabis use, and we look at the adjusted, um, let's look at the adjusted estimates. You can see when we compare hazardous work and non-hazardous, it's clear that across, regardless of cannabis use, um, the underlying risk for workplace injury is much higher um, for those in a hazardous work environment compared to those that are not. So regardless, being in a hazardous work environment already elevates your risk for a work injury. Um, the difference here, so you see, again, for general cannabis use, this slight increase. So the underlying risk for pasture use, um, for people who report pasture use, is about 26% for an injury. Um, in hazardous work compared to 10% um, in non-hazardous work. So there is a bit of an increase in both. When we look at um, workplace use, this is also where we really see, so again, across both, we see that generally speaking, hazardous um, workers in hazardous work are already at an elevated risk. 
but in particular, you add in that workplace use and 30, there's an absolute risk of 36% for an injury in that group. In non-hazardous work, we see 19%. And I don't want to diminish um, this increase. So what we really see is that whether you're in a hazardous work environment or in a non-hazardous work environment, you will see an increase in risk for, for workplace injury associated with workplace use. It's just that if you are in a hazardous work environment, it means just that much more because you're already at an increased risk just being in that hazardous work environment in general. Hopefully I explained that <laughs> well. Okay, and just, to, and just to remind people that all the predictors of workplace injury were assessed prior to the assessment of workplace injury in time. One of the strengths being the longitudinal study design used um, in this particular project as opposed to some of the previous projects. Um, Nancy, there's a, quite, a, quite a few questions. One is just around if you could provide some comments around impairment. So the, I guess the, the hypothesis is that cannabis use, certain types of cannabis use leads to impairment, um, which would lead to an increased risk of work injury. Could you maybe comment on uh, some of the challenges around ex like, I guess, assessing impairment as it relates to, to cannabis use in, in this area as we try to understand cannabis use and its relationship to work injury? Yeah, I mean, I think that is the biggest challenge in this um, space is that we don't have a true objective measure of impairment. Um, so most of these studies, they're self-report, but even if we look at the, um, you know, any studies that use drug testing, drug testing itself is not a measure of impairment. It's a measure of use of, of, the, of cannabis, but because cannabis remains in your system um, for quite some time, it gets stored in fat cells, um, it doesn't necessarily indicate that you were impaired. It doesn't even necessarily indicate recency of use. Um, and you know, sometimes what you'll actually see is that people who are using cannabis more often will, won't have as much in their system as someone who maybe are not used to using cannabis. Um, so it just there that I think is just a challenge in terms of being able to assess impairment. Now, there's different things that are done. Like I'm thinking about the sort of roadside um, impairment testing for um, when someone's you know. Uh, maybe have been using alcohol and they do all these sorts of tests, but I don't know how well that can um, uh, apply to what effects are of cannabis. Because a lot of times too with cannabis, there's this idea that you um, you adjust for some of your, you, you recognize your deficits and you can adjust for that. With alcohol, you can't. So I think there's just a general, a challenge in terms of, um, measuring impairment um and and i think that that's yeah that's all i have to say there <laughs> okay good we're well, running we are running short on time we do have lots of questions um sabrina has just put nancy's email in the chat box if we don't get to your question today you can certainly reach out to nancy around for more information about the study uh we do have a a, a, a couple of themes of questions at the moment one is around um you were sort of alluding to it before about how long someone has been using cannabis for and how frequently they use cannabis. Is it possible in this study to better assess sort of the length of use and the frequency of use as they relate to risk of work injury? Yeah, so we didn't actually capture information on um, length, so how long they've been using cannabis. We, we didn't ask any questions about when they initiated it or how long they've been using it on a regular basis. So we can't do that. I mean, we do have our, our items around frequency. Um, and I suspect it's not gonna be any different because the people that are really using it at the workplace are also the ones that are more likely to say that they're using it on a regular basis. Um, so I'm not, you know, that's something we haven't, formally assessed, but certainly we could um, we could take a look at, but we can't um, think about how long they've been using. We just don't have that information. Okay, and a final question um, before we wrap up is uh, uh, quite a few questions coming in just around the relationship between cannabis use and mental health. Also understanding that, that there is a relationship between work injury and mental health. Um, comments, reflections on, um, 
how does mental health uh, and cannabis use fit into today's picture or just in general around um, work that might be ongoing or that you're aware of in the area of cannabis use and, and mental health? Yeah, so I mean, if that's a good point, even in terms of um, this relationship. So we do know that some people with um, who may be struggling with mental health might be using cannabis. Um, and that might have been something we, we just weren't able to capture that in our study in terms of um, accounting for that in the in the relationship. Um, you know, it's a really good area. I we I we haven't really pursued that, um, and I know that there's just a lot of conflicting information around um, cannabis use, how it can lead to poor mental health problems. Is it really that, or is it mental health um, that they're using it because of mental health? Um, it's not something that we've been looking at yet in in workers, but I do think that that might be a good um, a good direction for us to take at some point in the future. Sorry about that. Um, thank you very much, Nancy. Um, I think we're at the end of today's presentation. We're, we have run out of time. There's a few other things that I, I need to mention before we close off for today. If people do have other questions, if they can, email Nancy directly and carnai at iwh.on.ca. I'm sorry that we didn't get to everyone's um, questions today. So for those of you who have asked, there is a, there will be a copy of the presentation as well as a recording of the webinar, uh, which will be available on the Institute's website on the speaker series webpage. Um, that will be available usually within the next week. Um, and so uh, as people have registered, you'll be sent an email to let you know when that's actually occurred. Our next um, speaker series talk will be taking place on April the 12th, um, which is by Faraz Bahid Shahidi, which will be on the employment quality of persons with disabilities, findings from a national survey. So please do um, in, uh, do come to that speaker series presentation again. Again, if you have an interest in the work of the Institute, if you could, you can go to the IWH website, iwh.on.ca backslash subscribe, and you'll be able to keep up to date with all of our um, news and information as it comes out. Thanks everyone for attending today, and we look forward to seeing you again at the next speaker series on April the 12th. Thanks very much and thank you, Nancy.